Come on, church, you feel that? I know I do. Hey, don't sit down yet. Let's just stay here for a second. Hey, 2019 is almost over. Someone would say, hallelujah. <laughs> the decade is almost over. And I can tell by the lack of excitement in the room that there may be some who are pumped about it. And there may be some who are not excited. Maybe what you're going into, what you're about to walk into, maybe what you're about to face um, is terrifying, is freaking you out. But I just want to encourage you, like in this moment, that God is closing the door on 2019 in your life. He's closing the door of a decade of your life. Now, no matter what you went through, what he did for you, what you struggled with, God brought you through it to right here, right now. And I can promise you, as he closes a door in this chapter, in this season of your life, it is only to serve the purpose that he's about to open up a bigger and a better door in your life. More relationship, more wealth, more joy, more freedom in your marriage, in your family. I promise you, God's got big things in 2020. You got something to look forward to. Ah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Hey, would you bow your heads and pray with us one more time? Jesus, you're good. You're great. We love you. We thank you for everything that you've done, you're doing, and you're going to do. Hmm. God, we thank you for new beginnings. We thank you for new years. We thank you that you're a God of seasons, that you work in seasons. You work in, in moments in our life that prepare us for the next moment in our life. And God, I thank you that as we get ready to walk into this new year, Father, that you would um, help us to just tune into you, to fix our eyes on you, and I ask that you would give us something to physically grab onto today that we can put deep down inside of ourselves and walk with in 2020. And God, I thank you for the Cowboys, that they're going to beat the Redskins today. And I never thought I would say this, Lord, but I'm praying for the Giants to whoop the Philadelphia Eagles so that we can get into the playoffs. And I still believe a playoff run and a championship Super Bowl ring is on the way in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, Amen. you may take your seat. The last crowd was pumped when I prayed for the Cowboys. You guys, not so much. That's because we're the spiritual ones, right? We came to get God's word, not to pray for cowboys. Well, guess what? We pray for him anyways, because I still believe in a God who can do miracles. Hey, give it up one more time. Make some noise if you're excited to be a church. My name is Bobby. If you don't know, aka B.O.B., the youth pastor here at the Connection Church, I got the privilege, I got the honor to stand up on this platform and to deliver the message today for Pastor Cole and his beautiful wife, Pam, and their daughters, Bethany and Mackenzie. They're taking a little break, and I just want you to give it up for them one time. Would you give it up for Pastor Cole, <laughs> Pastor Pam? Because I don't think you understand this totally, but you are all byproducts of his obedience. I don't think you thought about it like that. That his obedience to say yes many, many years ago to start a church gave you a safe place where you could come in and your life could be radically changed. Your family's direction could be altered and your spiritual destination has a greater eternity resting place because of one man who said yes. Therefore, if God asks you to do something in life and you do not say yes, you say no. Remember how many people are going to suffer because you didn't say Yes. That's a wow. So, oh man. Hey, real quick, we uh, get loud in this service, okay? 1030, I'm just going to be honest with you, we added seats. There was not a seat in the room. And so we are still a packed house, but um, I believe big things come in small packages. Like my brother-in-law, Nate, over here. I'd have him stand up, but you couldn't see him. <laughs> hey, anyways, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to preach to you. Um, this, I think, might be right now in my life my, my, my favorite 
piece of scripture, piece of Bible, piece of Jesus narrative in, in the entire book. Um, I've preached it once this year, and I'm going to preach it again in a fresh new way because for the last three months, I've got to be honest with you, God has been dealing with me in this area of my life, and now I feel like I'm fit to deal it to you. It is um, 1 Kings chapter 19, the story of Elijah after he just got done with a huge battle with a bunch of prophets of another God, a false God, and he has victory, um, and then he wanders off into the desert depressed. So we're going to pick up in verse 3, and we'll just kind of tell this story. Um, are you ready to hear God's word today, church? I'm going to ask that again because we can get a little bit more excitement in the room. Are you ready to receive God's word today, church? Verse 3, 1 Kings chapter 19 says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba in, a town, in the town of Judah. He left his servant there, and he went on alone into the wilderness. I'm going to stop it right there and preach. Can I preach? There are some people in your life you need to leave in 2019. There are some quote-unquote friends who serve no purpose, who serve no benefit, who do nothing but suck the ever-living, stinking life out of you. They're draining you of everything that God has created you to do and to be, and you need to leave them in 2019 as you get ready to walk into 2020. Amen. You know who they are. I don't have to name them. Holy Spirit's already been telling you to cut them out of your life. This is the season to do it, but... Elijah doesn't cut just anybody out of his life right here. Look, it says he left his friend in verse 3. He left his buddy. He left his bro. No, he left his servant. God puts servants in your life. The very person that God placed in Elijah's life to serve him, to help him, to aid him, to assist him, to be there for him. When Elijah needs encouragement, he's the word that God will put into to say, hey, bro, I got you. Get up. You don't walk through this valley alone. That's the person that Elijah says, stay here. I'm going to go on without you. Can I just tell you that's the most dangerous thing you can do as a believer is to push away the people that God put in your life? Yes, there are some people that you need to leave in 2019, but you need to rally the people that God put in your life to serve you. As iron sharpens iron, so a brother sharpens a brother or a sister. They are there for you no matter what, the thick and the thin. They're going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Can I get an amen, please? You need to make sure that you keep them around you because isolation to the believer is a serial killer of your faith. What do I mean? The devil wants nothing more than you to leave the person that God put in your life to remind you who you are and whose you are to stay over there so that you will believe all the lies that he tells you with no one to combat it over here. Anyways, I got to preach the rest of this message. When he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him. An angel of the Lord came to him. So let's check this out. Can I? Oh, this is good. He left his servant. He pushed his servant away. So God had to send him an angel to serve him. But while he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there was beside his head uh, some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came to him, touched him, and said, get up, lazy, and eat some more, or your journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate, and drank, and check this out. The food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of Sinai. I want to know what kind of carbs that angel gave Elijah <laughs> to sustain him for 40 days. I've been on keto for 15 days, and... Uh, Nobody else with me? Okay, yeah. When you deprive yourself in the flesh, you start to see stuff in the scripture, right? Like, I want those carbs. It gave him enough energy to walk 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of Sinai. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you 
doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. He's whining. He's throwing a fit. Torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord said to him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were loosed, and the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Then there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, I believe he recognized the voice. He wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I want to title today's talk, Reset Required. Reset Required. Okay, so we have no response like, ooh, ah, so I'm going to help you out. I was in the United States Marine Corps. Ooh-rah. Any Marines in the room? Holla at your boys, sir. Hey, so I went through boot camp. That's 90 days of help. It sucks, right? And they uh, would put you in these classrooms after they would keep you up all night. So they'd get you up like 4 o'clock in the morning. They would work you out like 40, 50 times a day. Then they would put you to sleep at like 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And they'd be like, hey, you're going to get like 4 to 2 hours of sleep. But you got a one hour of fire watch where you got to wake up and just stand there like a zombie and make sure no one comes in here and disturbs, steals, takes anything. And then you can go back to bed. So you really only get like 3 hours of sleep a night. And then they'll put you in this classroom where they're going to talk about like marine history from like 1800 era and you're just sitting there and you're falling asleep in this classroom setting with this very uh, non-approachable, non-exciting drill instructor teaching you the material. And as you would simply sit there and listen, you would start to doze off like some of you will in this sermon. I hope not, but it happens. Life happens, right? And the, the, the thing in boot camp was that the drill instructor would, would turn to your neighbor. Like, so if you were falling asleep, ma'am, and I saw you falling asleep, like, if this happens in the sermon, I'm going to do this too. I would look at your neighbor, and I would say, reset her. And they would take their hand. That was permission to take the open palm of your hand and just, <laughs> whoo! And it sends, I promise you, a jolt of <laughs> electricity down your vi- like your spine all the way to your heels. And you're like, ah! It's, just, it's called the reset button. So in honor of my title, uh, Reset Required, I want you to turn to your neighbor. I'm serious. And say, reset me. You thought I was going to say slap them. But I do give you permission. If your neighbor's falling asleep, go ahead, hit their reset button. Hey, because I want to talk about the power of the reset. I really read this scripture, and I feel like God's been putting on my heart the last couple of months, the power of the reset. What is a reset? Well, first off, at the beginning of a new year, new year, new me, right? Resolutions. A reset is not a resolution. Some of you are scared of a reset because you think you got to start over. No, 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 no. That's a restart. You don't want to restart. I'm 34. I'll be 35 in two months. I don't want to restart anything. I want God to reset my situation. I want him to reset my faith. I want him to reset my joy. I want him to come on, reset my marriage. And the thing about the reset is the purpose of it is that when you reset something, look at your phone for a second. When you reset your phone, a hard reset, it is to serve a purpose to restore that device back to its factory settings, to its original settings. So if you want God to restore your life today, if you want God to restore your hope today, if you want God to restore your peace today, then what you are asking is that you would reset my marriage back to the way that you intended my marriage to be. I need a reset, and may I prepare and present to you that a reset might be required in your life. I thought it was good. Thank you. 
Hey, holler back at me when we preach this today, okay? Bow your heads. Jesus, thank you so much that you're good, you're great, we love you. We thank you that you're going to get up all up in the message, that you're going to take my ego, you're going to take my pride, and God, that you would just do what you can only do. Give us something that we can see, that we can touch, and that we can experience today. We love you. Um, we thank you for the Cowboys win tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, everybody have a good holiday, good Christmas. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, yes. And then some of you are like, no, I know who had a great one. The ones that stayed home for Christmas, they're the ones like, yeah. The ones that traveled for Christmas, you're like, ugh. <laughs> we went to uh, my mother-in-law's which is in Houston, the day after Christmas. And uh, I just wanted to tell you this story because I thought it was cute, right? My wife has been dropping subtle hints. Um, Men, you know what I'm talking about. Husbands, uh, your wife will will drop subtle hints, breadcrumbs for you to pick up on and to to hopefully notice. Um, And this one for the last couple of months was, babe, I could really use a break from the kids. I could really use a getaway. Um... I really need just uh, a time away, just a moment or two, like with my girls. And so uh, I've been trying to give her that as much as I possibly can. But th- uh, at at our Christmas down in Houston, she uh, she had the opportunity on Friday to go with her mother and her sister-in-law to see this movie that just came out. Some of you ladies might know it, Little Women. Only one of you. Okay. Little Women, it's a girly thing, it's a chick flick, you know, like, they asked me, like, what's your favorite Christmas movie, is it, like, The Grinch, is it uh, Home Alone, I'm like, it's Die Hard, duh, <laughs> I want to go watch Little Women, I want to watch the original Christmas movie, Die Hard, yippee ki yay let's go, um, and so I'm like, sure, babe, you go, now, what that means is that I and my father-in-law now have to be responsible for my four nuggets And my sister-in-law's two nuggets, which gives us a total of six little kiddos, um, all under the age of eight, two of them infants, if you will. And um, and I'm like, sure, babe, do it. Go get yourself a break. And she goes, and now I know she's like, we're just going to go for the movie and we're going to come right back. I know that's a lie, girls. There's coffee before, there's coffee after, there's replacing the clothes that you got at Target or Kmart or whatever that you're like, oh, we could do this too. And I'm just like, this is going to turn into like eight hours of um, awesome bonding time with my father-in-law and my children. So they leave 30 minutes into it. I kid you not. My father-in-law is like, I need a break. I'm going to bed. And he takes one of the kids and he's like, you're going to come sleep with me. And I don't know what, how he got him to sleep, but he just like held onto him in a bear vice and just the kids screaming the whole time. But I'm like, I have too much. I'm trying to keep the kids from sticking like the, the, the forks and the outlets. And I, we got hoverboards and scooters for Christmas and they're riding them without shoes. And I'm like, you're going to rip your toenails off. Why are you not riding with shoes on? And it's just like six hours of ah, high intensity training, like hit training for me. And uh, my wife gets back, and she's like, oh, babe, thank you so much. I feel so rested. I feel so rejuvenated. And I'm like, I need a break from the kids. <laughs> Anybody ever felt like you needed to reset? Yeah. Man, you need to reset from your kids. You need, you need to reset from work. You need to reset from the boss. You need to reset from your husband. You need to reset from... Um, You need a reset from the vacation because the vacation wasn't a vacation. The vacation was like it wasn't a break. It was the thing that was breaking your back, right? Like we all need it. We know we need it. Elijah needs to be reset in this scripture. But here's the thing. He doesn't know how much he needs to be reset. I'll explain why. It says that he leaves and goes into the desert. Why does he go into the desert devastated and depressed, whining, throwing himself a pity party? Oh, me, oh, my, I wish I would die. Why? Well, if you backtrack into the story, there's this king, Ahab, and his wife, Jezebel. Anyone heard Jezebel before? Come on, talk to me. You've heard Jezebel? Yes, Right. Jezebel is the queen that is running the show to a king named Ahab. Now, she's evil. She is the one that brought bell worship into the country of Israel to the people of God. This means that God's people no longer sacrifice to God, Yahweh. They start sacrificing to Baal. 
And the crazy thing about it, when you study it out, it wasn't sacrificing animals. It was sacrificing babies. This is twisted, evil stuff. Elijah, as the prophet of God, says, I'm going to take this upon my mantle. I'm going to make this my mission. I'm going to eradicate. I'm going to eliminate all bell worship in the nation of Israel for God's people. Let's go. And he goes to war against 450 prophets of Baal. You know the story? Some of you don't. There's 450 prophets say, we're going to have a God off. See whose God's real and whose God is fake. So we're going to build an altar and we're going to put a sacrifice on it. And we'll call out to our gods and he'll rain down fire if he's the one true God and consume it. You do the same thing. You put a sacrifice on your altar and you call out to your God. And we're just going to see whose God is legit, right? Elijah's like, let's test this, Siri. I'm cool with it. I'm down. Let's go. And so while the 450 prophets are all day, like on their knees, like, <laughs> cutting themselves, crying, it's they're hungry, they're starving, they're fasting, and nothing is happening. While they're doing that, Elijah is patiently digging a moat around his altar. He fills it up with water so deep it's like a hot tub on his altar. And then after an entire day, he says, you tired? And they're like, yes, you do it. You won't have any luck. And he goes, God, move. Boom. It's like a blowtorch just exterminates the altar, the water, the sacrifice, and even the stones that he built the altar out of all burnt up in the fire of God. All the prophets of Baal bow down and worship the king of kings. And then Elijah takes out his sword and proceeds to cut the head off of 449 prophets of Baal. This is my kind of story. By the way, I believe um, that Elijah who was a bald, middle-aged man, looks a lot like your pastor. <laughs> Just saying, like, I think that Pastor Cole and Elijah are going to be doppelgangers in heaven or something like that. Um, so I see Pastor Cole just... Right? And he, he saves one. He kills 449 by his sword. He sends the 450th off to send a message to Jezebel. He, uh, he sends her a DM, a donkey message back in the day. <laughs> And she gets the message like, hey, this is what I've done. It's over. Go home. There's no more bell worship. I just killed all your prophets. The power of God moved. Everybody sees it. It's done. So she slides back into Elijah's DMs, donkey messages, and says, hey, if by this time tomorrow I haven't done what you've done to my prophets, so help me God. She has put a price tag on his head. There's a wanted poster with a bald little man on it saying, wanted, dead or alive. I can't help but think that he thought he won the battle. How many of you feel like you had a great victory? Everything's going good. And then you get that news, that messenger from Jezebel. And all of a sudden, your whole world comes crumbling and caving in. Come on. You know what I'm talking about, ladies. Some of you do. Everything could be going good in your marriage. We're good. We're rock solid. And then your husband confesses to what's been happening at the office. <laughs> Everything could be going good with the kids. We're great. We're awesome. And then all of a sudden, uh, your teacher calls you and says your son's been cheating on his spelling test. Oh, my gosh. We all have messengers. Messengers call you. Doctors are direct messages, right? Hey, your health. I thought I was good, but you got diabetes. You're going to have to poke yourself every day for the rest of your life and monitor and maintain, right? We all have those messengers. And the reason why the message always devastates is because you're worn out. It's because you're exhausted. He just got off this spiritual high. The best thing he could have done is went to bed got some sleep but the devil knew right when to hit him the message knew 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 knew, knew the right time man it's almost like he didn't even see it coming did he so he's devastated he's in the desert he's left his servant there and god says i'm going to reset you but first i got to recharge you this is my first point touch your neighbor and say recharge Verse 5, when he laid down and slept under the broom tree, and he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around beside him, and there was some baked bread and some water, so he ate it. He drank it. 
Then the angel came to him, touched him, and said, get up. I need you to eat and drink some more. Because if you don't, you will not have the energy. You will not have enough strength. You will not let me recharge you for your trip ahead. You got to be recharged. I like to reset by going bow hunting. Any kind of hunting in particular, but bow hunting. I got, I got my bow right here. This is my grandfather's bow. He's over there in the room, so you can give it up for the Bobby Alonzo Smith, my grandfather. It's a bow that he hunted deer with. Um, I have another bow. It's, it's not quite like this. It's a little more powerful. It's got more doodads and um, trinkets and gadgets on it, like, you know, sights and stuff. Um, this is how the old timers used to do it. Just shoop, shoop. Uh, What was that guy? Leonidas? No. Yeah, he shot, he shot bows, right? 300? Phew. This is just, this is more like the old school way. Now, the cool thing about this bow is this bow is a powerful weapon when it's strung. You know what I'm talking about? It's unstrung right now. Can this do any damage? Can this do any destruction? Does this thing have any power in it? It does, but the power is not harnessed until you apply pressure. See, some of you are like, God, I want you to be so powerful in my life, but you're running away from the pressure pack moments he's leading you into. The Bible says when I am weak, then I am strong because it's not my strength I'm relying on. So if you want to see God move in a powerful way, you have to let the tension You have to let the tension be applied. Now this thing is ready to go. Now this thing is charged up, ready to fire an arrow. At 45 pounds draw, this thing's going to shoot something at about 850 to uh, 10,000 feet per second. That's dangerous. That's lethal. God wants to take whatever moment you're in, and if you'll trust him that in the tension, in the, in the pressure, in, uh, 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 when you feel like everything is just is pulling you apart, that's when God can say, I can do something amazing in your life because you can no longer rely on your strength, but you have to rely on mine. Right, church? But here's the danger. <laughs> A lot of us live like this. You know what I'm talking about, high strung, wound up, under pressure, all day, every day, 365 days. Some of you have been living like this for the last decade, and you wonder why you're so stressed out. Because you never rested. See, this bow is powerful when it's strung, but if it stays strung too long, if it stays wound up too long, here's what will happen. These limbs will get bent out of shape, and it will lose its power in general. See, if you want to remain a powerful weapon, sometimes you just got to unwind. Now the bow can, it was charged, but now the bow can recharge. That deserves a clap, church. Because God wants you to know that there is someone in the room who's like, I know, 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 but like, you don't understand, like, I don't have the time. Look at what Psalms 23 says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. And then I was reading it, and it was like, dun, 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 light bulb moment. I was like, you can't have God's restoration without resting first. Some of you don't want to rest because you're like, I don't got the time to rest. I don't got time for that. You better make time. Let me ask you this. Pull out your phones. Look at it. Look at it. Just look at it. Look at it. Look at the bottom of it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a port on the bottom of it. It's called your charging port. How many times do you charge your phone a day? 
And yet you don't charge your life at all. You'll give your phone a break from your usage, but you won't give your life a break from your usage. Look, when you resist God's rest, you resist his charge in your life. And if you want God to reset you, you're going to have to, if you're going to, if you're going to be able to do something in 2020, you're going to have to have the strength and the energy to do it. And it's going to require a lot out of you. So you better make time to rest. Some of you need to just rest in the finished work of Jesus. Some of you are trying so hard. I got saved by grace. Now I'm going to maintain my salvation by doing really good. God didn't come for that. God came for the messed up and the broken and the people. And he said, guess what? If you could do it, there would be no need for me. But you couldn't do it. No man is righteous. No, not one. So I came down to do for you what no one could do for themselves. And so I have saved you by my grace through your faith in me, not of your own works. So none of you can boast about it. Here's the deal. When you screw up, when you fell, if you believe in Jesus, you're already forgiven. Some of you are trying to get forgiven so that you can get back up and try harder. And if you would change your mentality, if you would rest in the finished work of Jesus, you would see it not as a religion but a relationship. And you could get up because as Grace said, I've already covered that. Get up and let's go forward. A baby doesn't learn how to walk without falling a few times. Spiritual Christians don't mature from infancy to maturity without falling down a few times. It's God's grace that helps you get back up. You've got to recharge. You've got to rest. You've got to rest. And when he gives them rest, he gives them the strength to walk. It reminds me of Isaiah 4, 40, 29 through 31. It says, I give strength to the weary. I increase power to the weak. Even in your youth, you may grow tired and weary. And young men may stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not grow faint Elijah need you to get your strength up so that you can walk and not faint so that I can go to this mountaintop experience with you and I can he's already worked on his rest he's already recharged him now God's going to reset his focus You can't get your focus reset until you get your rest right. I want to show you this before we move on to the next point. September, I wrote this note. It says, fatigue is the enemy of focus. You can Google it. You won't find it because that's mine. (laughs) Then today is so rare to find an OG quote, an original quote. But fatigue is the enemy of focus. Um, I just, I put that on the computer in front of me, slapped it there. Because I was coming home, I was coming back to work every day. Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, and I was just flat out exhausted, right? My, my level of focus wasn't there. Your focus can always be determined by your level of fatigue. And I just put it on there just as a reminder to, you can go home and rest and take a break from work, but there's a difference between resting right and resting wrong. I mean, Jesus even rested, right? He got away from his disciples and the miracles, and he rested. Because if he was empty, he would have nothing to give the people. God, for crying out loud, first day, created the heavens and the earth, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and on the seventh day, he what, church? If God needs a rest, you need a rest. So he, he rests him, and then he refocuses him. Verse 9, there he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here? That's funny, Right? God said, go to the mountain, and then when Elijah got to the mountain, he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I'm doing what you asked me to do, God. That's not what he responds, is it? Maybe God knew what was on the inside. Because Elijah throws this fit. He says, I zealously served you, the Lord Almighty, my whole people, and covenant with you. The altars, they've killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too, God. His perspective is off. 
He's lost all perspective. It's so like inwardly focused on his situation. First off, your statement that you're the only prophet left is not true. In chapter 18 of 1 Kings, you see that Obadiah finds 100 prophets of God. And in fear that Ahab and Jezebel are going to kill him, takes 50 and hides them in this cave, unnamed cave, so no one will know their location. Takes the other 50, hides them in another unknown location, safe house, safe caves, so that there's still 100 prophets of God left. So Elijah, you're actually the 100 and first prophet remaining. Or if you go down into verse 19, 18 of this chapter, God responds with, yet I've reserved, preserved 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed their knee down to Baal or kissed him. Actually, there's 7,000 people who've never worshipped Baal. So Elijah, your statement that you're the only one left is a selfish statement. But how many of you know that perspective is um, altered by your pain? Oh, me, oh, my, my problems. This is just me. How do you lose perspective? You can zoom in on something, laser focus, right? And I lose perspective of everything else. I could take my eyes. I wanted to have someone come up here and just, like, stand here, and maybe I could stand over here, and you could look at me, and then we'll have someone stand over there, and we'll just have them, hey, what's going on? What do you think the person in the middle's head is going to respond with? My point is, you can lose perspective when you take your eyes off something or you start to listen to other voices in your life. And how you know you've lost perspective, check this out, is when all you can hear is your feelings. (laughs) I'm going to get you right now. Because in worship, I was watching some of us, and, uh, and it just looked pretty sorry like this. I'm not knocking you. You may want to worship you, you, right? But I can tell you that your attention can't be in two places at one time. And I can tell where your attention is if it's not on Jesus and praise and worship. It's on your problems. It's on your worries. It's on your marriage. It's on your job. It's on what's coming up next year. And you're focused on something and it's taking your attention off something else. Men, you won't raise your hands because you're worried about what you might look like. Your attention is on that, so it's restricting you. Man, if you had your attention on God, your worries would just dissipate and disappear, and you couldn't help but jump up and down. You couldn't help but scream at the top of your lungs. Grown men would cry because there would be a sense that there was such an overwhelming power and sense of control in your life that you would shout with praise. You're amazing, but your attention is off. You've got to be able to tune out to tune in. Elijah is tuned in to the wrong voice. He's tuned in to the message of Jezebel, right? That's an external voice. We have that. That's issues. That's problems. That's storms in your life. But there's also another voice that he's now focused on. And you can see it in the text. It's his internal voice, his internal voice, his feelings. Stop focusing on your feelings. Your feelings aren't fake. I'll validate your feelings. Feel your feelings, but don't focus on your feelings because even though your feelings are not fake, your feelings could be false. And when you start to follow your feelings and you stop following your faith, God's going to go, I need to reset your focus. So he takes him onto a mountain. Chapter 19, verse 11, go out, stand on the mountain. And the Lord passed by and there was a terrible blast and the rocks were torn loose but God wasn't in that wind there was an earthquake the commotion the roar stuff ripping and falling apart right before his eyes but God wasn't in the earthquake there was a fire bigger than bass drops it's a joke the Lord wasn't in the fire then there was a gentle whisper the Lord said what are you doing here ask them the same question again See, Proverbs 4.20 says, dear friends, listen well to my words and tune your ears into my voice. I can't help but thinking Elijah now asked the same question twice after seeing all of the stuff. He's going, uh, 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 what am I doing here? I'm, uh, I'm learning to listen to you again. 
I'm learning to keep my eyes on you no matter what else is going on in my life. Look, man, there was an earthquake. Your world could seem like it's falling apart. There could be a mighty wind and a storm that comes and tries to blow you down, knock you over. You could go through the fires of hell that is trying to burn up your life, burn up your career, burn up your reputation. But Jesus is saying, just like he did to Peter, if you can keep your eyes on me, you can walk in a supernatural way. Got to refocus my attention, my gaze, my eyes, my ears. I got my, I got my ears tuned into you so that you can re-engage. You got a few seconds left, church? He's falling asleep next to you. Reset him real quick. See, the purpose of the reset is so that you can re-engage with what God called you to do. Verse 15 of chapter 19 said, the Lord told him, go back, Elijah, the same way you came through the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hezael to be king, anoint Jehu to be king, and anoint Elisha, son of Snapchat, I mean Shaphat, to be your replacement as prophet. What you don't know is that Hezael and Jehu will become kings of the north and the south, and they will eradicate the bell worship. They will eradicate Ahab. They will eliminate Jezebel. So if Elijah doesn't re-engage with what God's called him to do, there will be no deliverance for his people. So Elisha needs a reset so that he can re-engage with what God's asked him to do. How many mommies do I have in the room? How many fathers do I have in the room? How many husbands do I have in the room? My God, husbands, let me speak to you for a moment. God's called you to re-engage with not just your wife, but your family and your children and your children's friends. He wants you to be a leader amongst your household. And if you want to re-engage with this, some of us, myself included, are need of a reset. God, we've got to rest so that we can have, good Lord, the patience to, to refocus how to, uh, to raise the children in such a manner, in such a way that uh, reflects their Heavenly Father's love towards them. Women, listen to me. Mommies, you got to reset from being a mommy so that you can re-engage with being a mommy right after we close this service. See what I'm saying? God wants you to re-engage. I'll close with this story. You can take this. I went to this school called Sears School. It was a school where they did prisoner of war training. They taught me how to evade and escape and resist um, interrogations, um, being held hostage, it was a pretty intense school. And after a week of just going through all this training of this is how you beat good cop, bad cop. This is how you beat this interrogation. When this interrogation comes into your life, you, you defeat it by, by answering and responding this way. And there was this instructor, and he would give me all these classes on how you do it. And then it was the ghost scenario, and I ran around in the woods for four days, and then I got caught by a bunch of big grizzly men, and they put me in a potato sack, and they took me, they threw me into this, like, little dog kennel and there was a speaker and it was this guy in Russian just screaming at me and they sleep deprived me for two days and then they would take me out and they would just beat me and try to get the information and the intel out of me and even though I knew it was training I was starting to wear down rest was depleted my focus was gone and then they brought me into this one where this is the guy that's just like hey I'm gonna break your hand if you don't tell me the information that I'm asking for and I was like whatever man like I can handle this and so like he's whooping me up once I poof, 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 whooping me down the other side poof, poof, poof. and I'm like ah and he's like pray to your God to stop this hand from hitting your face and I looked at him right in the belly button and I said I don't need God to protect me from you I'll handle my own business and he picked me up by my collar and we went through this wall and then he picked me up like the rock, and we went through this wall. I found out that they were plywood walls, and it was meant to just, like, shock and all. And I was, like, in this moment, I was freaking out for my life. I was, like, lost all focus. I'm, I'm going down with, I'm not going down without a fight. I'm taking an ear. I'm taking a pinky. I'm taking a chunk of elbow with me, like, Arr! And then all of a sudden, the lights come on, and this instructor walks in. And he says, technical timeout. 
It's like technical timeout. And the, and the interrogator, the bully, he runs into the corner like this. And he puts his head in the corner like he's in timeout. And I'm like, technical timeout, you mean I can run away? He's like, no, timeout, buddy, timeout, 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 timeout. Hey, 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 if you do this in real life, the terrorists are just going to kill you. You have no hope. You have no chance. Do you remember what I taught you to do a week ago when you faced this kind of situation? Now, here's the interesting thing. Stay with me. Because my problem didn't leave the room. But when something walked into the room, it brought peace that even my problem couldn't touch. Woo. He said, do you remember what I taught you? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he's like, okay, okay. Hey, hey, refocus. Get a rest. Refocus. <laughs> I'm telling you, verbatim. And he said, are you ready to re-engage with your mission? And I said, yes, sir. And as soon as he walked out that door, that guy came back right over here. And he's like, pray to God that my hand. I was like, oh, dear Jesus, save me. Like, <laughs> but the point is, there was something that I had to do. I had to rest. I had to refocus so that I could re-engage with my mission. If I got anybody in the room who's ready to re-engage with their hope, re-engage with their faith, re-engage with their joy, re-engage with their wife tonight, re-engage with their children, even though he's at college, you can pick up. If you're ready to re-engage, God is ready to re set you would you bow your heads and close your eyes Jesus thank you so much for a great day God I thank you that we're heading into a new year that we're going to be we're going to be well rested realigned with our attention on you refocused ready to re-engage with what everything with whatever and everything you call and ask us to do Whatever our mission is, whatever our purpose is, from the simple forms of just taking care of babies, raising children, to working at a job, to sharing our faith with people in our community, God, thank you. There's someone in the room who just says, I want to reset my life. I've never even allowed room for God to have a space in my life. I want to... I want to reset right now with him. The Bible says, Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, come to me, all you who are tired and weary, who are worn out, burn out on religion, and I'll show you what a real rest looks like. He's speaking of your spirit. He's speaking of your soul. He's speaking of your uh, striving and your trying. And he said, just stop all that and allow me to have space in your life as the Lord of it, and you'll find a rest that is unheard of. If that's you, you know who you are. I believe the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door to your heart. Only he, only the Holy Spirit can draw men and women unto Jesus. So if you feel that, I'm going to ask you on the count of three, raise your hands high, shoot it up. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he took your sin, he took your shame, and he took the punishment for it at the cross, put it in a grave, and three days later was victorious over all of it, giving all those who believe and confess with their mouth new life, freedom, ownership, sons and daughters of a king of kings and a lord of lords. Three, if you want that, raise your hand high and keep it up. And listen to me when I tell you this. Salvation with my God is a one and done deal. You don't have to get resaved. Once you believe, he's got you. He is faithful in keeping all that God has given to him. He's got you. So when you go into 2020 and you hit that moment, you hit that storm, and it rocks you to your core, you can have confidence that even though you screwed up, even though you messed up, even though you, you failed miserably, God still has you, and he still loves you, and he's still got a purpose for you, and he's still got a plan for you in the name of Jesus. Three, keep that hand up. God, thank you that every hand say, raised is a heart saved. Thank you that freedom right now is being experienced. That, that, that just the outward sign, the external uh, movement of raising a hand just represents the internal movement of just faith erupting on the insides of individuals. And thank you that there is forgiveness and freedom and family. If you raise your hand, just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me of my sins, calling me yours, giving me a new life, resetting my life, giving me a place 
in heaven, giving me a new identity. I believe it. I receive it. And I want you in charge of my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, come on, church. And everyone said, celebrate those decisions. Here's what we want you to do. If you made a decision, I want you to come meet us right down here.